Thank you, Bobby. Good to receive some of the service Bobby has to offer. Good to have Bobby and Shirley back with us and from years gone by. <laughs> I didn't have to say that. Well, I won't talk about who's older or any of that stuff. I, it didn't come out of my mouth. So, I uh, decided that tonight, uh, I, if you've read the article in the bulletin, if you haven't, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, I'd like to address that a little more in detail in our time in the evening. We, uh, when we meet on Sunday night, we meet in the fellowship hall, and sometimes there's some two-way communication, more like a class that goes on during lessons, and I think that subject deserves some interaction, and I think uh, it's something on all of our hearts today uh, as we prepare to celebrate a holiday and see the, the shape that our world is in. And uh, we can certainly sing that song. I'm glad that this is not our home. This is not the future. Well, there's a more glorious future planned. But uh, we sure like to take more people with us than we have to this point. So let's, uh, let's think in those terms. And if you would join us tonight at 5. Our Kingdom of Heaven series, uh, the, the picture that I chose here uh, represents the coming of Jesus to the earth from heaven, from his Father, uh, from God. But in Matthew's Gospel, uh, he tells everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so one of the things I wanted to, to get to as we got into this series, uh, the words that Jesus used to describe what that meaning, what, what, is it, what does the kingdom look like, and what are we actually looking for, uh, there are several times that Jesus uses the word inherit. Now, uh, inheritance is not a word we, we uh, talk about a lot. It's not a word that we experience uh, multiple times in our life. If, in fact, you receive an inheritance, you might very well realize that, uh, well, that was it. <laughs> that, that's the one time that's going to happen. And it's, uh, it's not a common occurrence, and it's certainly not something that happens in every case by any means. But we do understand that if you are to inherit something, there is something future-oriented about that. Now, when you use the word kingdom and the word future in the same sentence in a religious context, let me just say, you could be talking about anything. And a as I read commentaries... And preparing this, all the weeks that, that I've uh, been studying this, uh, commentaries fall in certain categories. And they very clearly have one thing in mind, and they go directly to that, and every scripture they can come up with applies to what they think is going to be the end. And we're hearing a lot today about this being the end times. And as scripture points out, uh, that's been true for 2,000 years. So before you, you know, sell your house, let's think about this a little bit. And uh, that's pretty important. Luke chapter 17 is the verse that I ended with, the verses I ended with last week, that begin to change the way Jesus described. We looked at several parables, and Jesus' descriptions were, were helpful, but cloudy uh, at best, because there were a lot of people that heard the parables, and they said, I don't have a clue what that was all about. And there were others that did seem to understand, and they were the ones close to Jesus who were listening and asking questions and hearing the, the explanations as Jesus shared those. But at one point, and this is sort of late in Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees were questioning him. That means they were dogging him, okay? They were after him. They were questioning him as to when the kingdom of God was coming. Nail it down for us. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Now right there, folks, half of the religious world or three-fourths of it just went out the window. Because that's all they want to talk about. Well, the signs of the times, the signs of the end, the signs of this, the signs of that. Jesus said, you're barking up the wrong tree. 
if you think there's going to be some sign that's going to let you know that the kingdom is here, we'll, we'll see what he did say about that in a moment. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Within you, one version says. Among you, one version says. It is already here. And I think as we look at the passage we also read last week in Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Matthew just explains the ministry of Jesus and says Jesus was going through all the cities and the villages. He was teaching in their synagogues. He was proclaiming the gospel, the good news of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And that's where we started. We talked about how Matthew establishes in chapters 8 and 9, right after the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus is demonstrating his power over anything anyone can throw at him. There is no sickness he cannot heal. He can even raise the dead. There is no demon strong enough to even cause him to blink because he has power over those. We'll read a verse about that again this week. But he is telling people about the good news of the kingdom. Now the words that he used, and we'll go back to Matthew 4 for this, the answer to when is the kingdom, and now you see the disconnect. If I put when is the kingdom, and then these words, <laughs> this is the answer. It's at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is, it is right close, nearby, ready. It's on the edge of existence. And so we're announcing that. Then he uses this term, in your midst. And clearly, he's saying there's something about the kingdom that is right now. Okay, and now I'm going back 2,000 years when I say now. All right? So when is the kingdom? There is the now dimension. And... There is the not yet part. Now, this is actually a phrase that was made popular by a commentator who just, he was just trying to explain what he was seeing. And he used the term now and the not yet. Boy, that has really resonated with a lot of people. Because there's a sense in which the rule of God is in our lives. We, we know and we experience that. But we look around this and we say, oh boy, there, he is not in charge of everything yet. And that day will come. So there is a not yet associated with this. Now, Matthew chapter 16. I read this verse a couple of weeks ago. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here. This is the chapter where, G where Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Just a few verses later. There are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now that is very specific. Lucian and I were talking this morning about Scripture speaks of several comings of Jesus. Now we know that He came in the flesh, in the incarnation, the walking on the earth and all of these phrases coming from out of His mouth while He walked the earth. And we know that he's coming again, and we call that the second coming. But when you read passages in the Gospels, particularly talking about things like the destruction of Jerusalem, when these stones will not be so beautiful, there won't be one set on another, that, that Jesus came in judgment many times. And certainly that's described in the book of Revelation. And so for, for Jesus to come is not unusual but for him to come in his kingdom is pretty specific. And so we need to adjust our thinking to whatever, whatever we thought it was going to be needs to include this verse and what it must mean. Now, along about this same time, interestingly, I mean, the, the, the topic is just a hot topic. There are a lot of discussions. The rich young ruler walks up to Jesus. And he says, 
Uh, in one, one gospel, it says, what good thing do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And in the other gospels, he says, you know, good teacher. What do I need to do to her- inherit eternal life? And Luke actually mentions that there were two times that, that something similar to this occurred, which is just interesting to me. But the rich young ruler comes, and, and you might remember that Jesus says, well, how about the commandments? Well, I've done that. I'm, I've, I've kept the commandments from my youth. And, and, and he's pressing Jesus for what is lacking. Okay? So Jesus, being the honest, loving man that he is, looks at him with compassion and, and he says, I, I'll tell you what's standing in your way. You need to sell what you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. And that is not what that man wanted to hear. Now here's what's interesting. I'm going to read this verse in Mark chapter. I'm going to go to Mark because of the particular wording here. Peter and the apostles are standing there and they're thinking, sell what you have and give to the poor. Well, Lord, we left everything to follow you. Like, you know, we did what you just said. So what about us? And this is Jesus' answer. I say to you, There is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and only Mark says that, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now there's a very clear distinction being made here that there is a now and there is a not yet. There is a what happens in the age we're living in and we still live in that age, okay? And then there is the age to come. Now, we talked about eternal life, and I'm, I'm going to go on record as saying, as Jesus talks in John about what eternal life is, John 17 in his prayer, he says eternal life is to know the Father and the one who was sent. Well, that's something you and I know now. So we, we've often talked about how eternal life is something that begins when we're born again. And it goes from now on, and it's eternal you know, death just is, is just not even an event on that horizon because it, it, there's no interruption in our eternal life. It's already been dispensed. But there's still a not yet associated with that kind of the way two people prepare for instance to be married. They meet. They fall in love. They spend hours and hours together. They do things together. They meet the extended family. They're not married. They set a day, they invite their friends, and on that day they exchange rings and vows and they become married. And that changes things. Now you look at that couple when they're standing up there giggling, and I mean, really, what did it change? They were already in love. They were already committed to each other. Well, it changed everything. That's what it changed. Because the not yet became now. And it's official. And so we can look at our heavenly home as the day, you know, when you we cross the threshold of the judgment seat of God, as Matthew read for us this morning, there's no turning back. There's no oops. There's no, well, I meant to, but I didn't get it. <laughs> there's no question anymore. And while there shouldn't be questions, there should be confidence. There should be drawing near with boldness and all the things that... that we're told to do. The not yet part of that equation is real for us. We realize there's more to come. There's more to be had. Now let me, let me share a couple of things with us. Going back to Matthew chapter 8. I want to look at the demons just for a minute. They cried out saying, this, these are the gatherings I believe is how Matthew talks about it. There are two in Matthew. They're in the tombs. They're they're banished from people. But Jesus goes to them and they cry out that this is the demon. What business do we have with each other, son of God? 
Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's in derision. That's not supportive belief, okay? But it is belief. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Before what time? Jesus just did the Sermon on the Mount. What has he taught that suggests there is a time coming? Well, they already know. They've already experienced the judgment of God. They've been cast out of heaven. And they see this is the Son of God, and everywhere they see Him, they want to name Him, and He says, Hush, I don't need your testimony. And Jesus said, Be quiet and come out of Him. Throwing Him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of Him. They were all amazed so that they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Now I referred to this the first week. But I want us to see the reality that kingdom, the kingdom and the king were being opposed and challenged. When the demons came after Jesus, they perceived that they were more powerful than human beings. That had been their experience. They're in this guy. He couldn't get rid of it. He couldn't keep himself from shouting. He couldn't keep himself from cutting himself with rocks. He couldn't help it that he could break a chain. But they met Jesus. And they didn't have any power over Jesus. And if Jesus says, come out, they come out. <laughs> and then right now. And you can not like it if you want to. And with your loud shriek, you can protest. But you're coming out. Because Jesus is the king. And he is establishing his authority. And everybody can see that. But the kingdom does not come without opposition. Now it would be very, very easy for us to say, well, of course, Satan opposed Jesus. May I remind you who else opposed Jesus? The religious leaders who were looking for him did not believe in him even as much as these guys did. So there was opposition and there was challenge every step of the way for Jesus. And he's trying to put out a concept of what kingdom is when they've already decided what it is and they're trying to tell him what it is. It's just backward. Now, another thing that seems to be upside down is who is involved and who this kingdom is for. In Luke chapter 6, this is a form of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the Sermon on the Plain. But he turned his gaze toward his disciples and he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. That is, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you, even though you're poor and you don't have anything else. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And if I could combine that with the passage where he talked to Peter, you know, you're going to have a hundred times as much in this, in this world. I mean, look around the room. There's apparently more than a hundred of us in here. Yeah, we, we have a lot. And we don't allow one another to go hungry. That's not going to happen. We have each other. That's what the kingdom was meant to be. But it's for the people who don't seem to have hope, who are poor, who are hungry, who are weeping. And he's come to help that situation. Again, that's from our first week. But here's the opposition. The tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to him. The Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Opposition. Challenge. You can't be the Messiah. You eat with sinners. Jesus said, did you not read Isaiah? Who am I going to help? The prophets said so. But they're not listening to that. And they're not believing in him. The kingdom is for the poor and the oppressed. And 
what Jesus began to realize and find out and prove is that they were the ones willing to listen. Because if you've got everything, like the rich young ruler, you might go away sorrowful that what you lack is to stop loving your possessions so much and follow Jesus. But if you're poor, <laughs> what have you got to lose? Uh, it, the Roman government isn't going to be your salvation. The Jews aren't going to be your salvation. They won't even spend time with you. The kingdom is for them too. So, it is not who you think. It's not when you think, it's not who you think. And this is where we were last week. Some are able to see the kingdom. Nicodemus was told, you need to be able to see the kingdom. And some are willing to receive the word of the kingdom, the good news. They're, they're, they're able to take that and say, oh, I get it. This, this is about right now and later as well. And then there are those who will enter the kingdom. And we established last week that even by entering, you know, we can change our mind. The cares of the world can become more important. A wealth can become more important even to someone who the word has penetrated and it has grown and sprouted. It can be temporary. So I want to appeal to two passages uh, further in the New Testament and establish a couple of things about what this kingdom, this inheriting, is really about. There's actually more about inheriting the kingdom in the rest of the New Testament. So 1 Corinthians 15 is a great chapter on the resurrection. And, and this is pretty deep. This is 50 verses into that chapter. Alright? Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now just right there, what do you know? I have not yet inherited the kingdom. I still have flesh and blood. So how's that going to work, Jesus? Jesus? Paul says, nor that will the perishable inherit imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, sleep being the word for death, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The dead and the living will inherit the incorruptible. That is, the body will be such that it can be eternal. A spiritual body, Paul talks about. But flesh and blood cannot inherit. And so when Jesus, in the passage in Matthew 25, he came to talk about what was really going to happen at that moment when the last trumpet sounds and the dead are raised, what are we raised to? He says, the Son of Man comes in His glory. That sounds to me like the second coming. The angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. That won't be the first time. He was sitting on it. Actually, He rose when Stephen was stoned. Stephen saw that. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the verse that we read, that Matthew read for us this morning, the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Not just the coming of Jesus on the earth, this has been God's plan from all eternity. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. I was sick. I was naked. I was a stranger. You took care of that. You looked at me and you saw someone that needed help. And you did what I did when I walked the earth. Remember? It's for the poor and the oppressed. And they're told they're welcome to come in. But then the same thing happens to the goats, those on the left, and they say, well, I don't remember seeing you ever. Same way the righteous said. Jesus said, well, no, you didn't see me and you didn't see them. You didn't help them. You didn't relieve any suffering. You didn't do what I did when I was on the earth. 
his words at the end of that passage, truly I say to you, to the extent you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The phrase eternal life does not appear in the Old Testament, ever. There's one allusion to life after death in the book of Daniel. They believed that passage, and there are some discussions that the Pharisees have with Jesus, but they don't understand eternal life. What we need to understand is that we are preparing for the life that follows, for the not yet, for the age to come, for the actual inheritance, for the will to be read and the inheritance to be dispensed. And that day has not occurred yet. Paul gives this warning in Ephesians. Know this with certainty, no immoral, impure, or covetous man who's an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. Immoral, impure, covetous, Ten Commandments stuff, that doesn't exist in the age to come. The sheep will be separated from the goats. And there are people today who are running around saying, well, now, you know, you just need to get up with the times because that stuff's not wrong anymore. Excuse me? Who died and left you to be God? Last time I checked, he says something one time, and that's how it is from now on. So don't let someone come along and deceive you and cost you your inheritance because you think it's okay to love money when the rich young ruler couldn't do that. It's not, it's not right today just because it's a new day. So in order to enter, as we've talked in the weeks gone by, we must be born again. Nicodemus was told, you've got to be born of the water and the Spirit. You've got to see it and you've got to respond to it. We must do the will of our Father in heaven. As Jesus prayed in the model prayer, and as he told them, you know, you can call me Lord all you want to, but if you're not doing what I'm saying, I'm not your Lord. You're fooling yourself. We must humble ourselves as a child while the disciples want to argue about who's the greatest. The stance before God is humility, kneeling, <laughs> realizing that as a child we approach our Father in heaven. And we cannot love wealth or anything else more than. So these are things just to enter. They become the same things in order to inherit. But if you want to enter, the now becomes the not yet. Eternal life begins. When you're born again, you're born not to die again. You will pass from this age to the next, but you will not lose consciousness. You will be aware of things. The now becomes the not yet, or the not yet becomes the now, however you want to look at that. As Jesus preached from day one, if you want to inherit the kingdom, you repent now, and you enjoy eternal life. So he told the rich young ruler, what you need to do is get rid of this covetousness, sell what you have, give it to the poor. That's repentance. Now come and follow me and you have treasure in heaven. That eternal life is yours. You ask the question, what do I need to do to have eternal life? I'm telling you. <laughs> it, it is all my life, it's just been incredible to me that someone could ask that question and walk away. Did you not understand what you were asking? And who you were speaking to. We need to continually repent so that our lives are what they should be. And finally, if you want to inherit, you need to treat others well. The Pharisees thought it was okay to look down on the tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes and the whatever. 
anything that wasn't as good as they were. There's no room to look down except to lift up. And the way we treat other people is the standard of judgment that Jesus says he will use. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, I don't care if you can cast out demons in my name. You could perform miraculous signs. Does that make you close to me? Not if you're not doing what I did, which is holding out my hand to help others to be in their world, to associate with them, to lift them up to the kingdom life. I want to read a final passage as we close, Romans 13. I actually changed this this morning. It sounds like the one I previously read, but I, w I want you to hear the, the urgency and the day-by-day -day need for us to tune in to kingdom things. Paul in Romans 13, right after his passage, by the way, about the government. <laughs> he says, do this, and he's talking about loving your neighbors yourself. Do this knowing the time. It is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. This time he's not talking about death. Salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. We're closer to the end than we were at the beginning. Well, now that's pretty logical. No, but it's more than that. It's pretty urgent. The night is almost gone. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness. It's not night, it's day. And put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, just, just feeding my senses. Not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. He's talking about clothing there. When you lay out your clothing for how you're going to go through the day. Don't lay out the clothes to go and carouse and be drunk and sexually immoral. Don't, don't make provisions for when you're going to do that. Don't make plans. Don't make a schedule. Don't say, well, it's not Sunday so I can do that stuff because on Sunday I go to church and on the other days I do whatever I want to. Not if you're in the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom... There are no Sundays and Mondays. There's the day you worship together and there's the day you worship maybe by yourself or with a family. That's all there is in the difference. I'm not making any provision for anything but Christ. I want to wear Christ. I want to look like Christ. I want to act like Christ. I want to spread the love of Christ. And in doing so, I make the kingdom a present reality for whoever I'm in contact with. And... I share my hope that this is not all, there's more, and it's coming. And I pray that we can have this hope. And it can become a reality for us each moment we're alive. I was sharing this morning, uh, I did not know uh, Roy Heim, the president of the Historical Society that's met in our building many, many times, passed away. Roy was mowing out across from our office at Crystal City uh, not two weeks ago. I'm telling us, folks, we don't know. We don't know. As Paul said, it's, it's day. The night is over. It's time for us to realize really where we are and just how fragile life can be. And I want to implore you, if you have not taken the, the things of the kingdom seriously, there is no time like the present because it's all you have. There are no guarantees for tonight or tomorrow. And I ask you to respond to the call of Jesus to be a part of His kingdom and a part of the ministry and mission of being Jesus to the world. 
and be a part of a group of people that wants nothing else in life and wants to rejoice with you as you begin your walk. If you're ready to be born again, if you're ready to adjust that walk, create the repentance needed so that you are ready to be an inheritor of the kingdom, will you come right now while we stand and sing?